Thank you for joining us for the Oli Foundation webinar, What Patients Need Their Doctors to Know, Keeping the Care in Healthcare. My name is Andrea Guidi. I am an executive assistant here at the Oli Foundation. Most of you are probably familiar with the Oli Foundation, but just in case this is your first experience, I'd like to briefly introduce the organization. The Oli Foundation strives to enrich the lives of those living with home nutrition support, both intravenous nutrition, sometimes called HPN or TPN, and tube feeding. We do this through education, outreach, and networking. The Oli Foundation was founded in 1983 by Dr. Lynn Howard and her patient Clarence Oli Oldenburg. Today, we serve approximately 25,000 members and all of our programs are free or charge for patients and their families. First, I'd like to do a few housekeeping details. You should see a toolbar on the bottom of your screen you can use the chat function to send a message directly to myself or Dr. Wishmeyer. In the Q&A function, please type any questions you have for Dr. Wishmeyer. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session period at the end of the presentation. Please note we will not be responding to the hand raising function in the control panel. We will post the recording of the presentation after the webinar on the Oli Foundation website. Please note we have muted all the participants, so you don't need to worry if there is a background noise where you're taking this webinar. If you are having technical issues, please go to the Zoom website on the address you see on our screen. And now for the presentation. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Paul Wishmeyer. Dr. Wishmeyer is a critical care, preoperative, and nutrition physician who serves as a professor with tenure of anesthesiology and surgery at Duke University School of Medicine in Durham, North Carolina. He also serves as the Associate Vice Chair for Clinical Research in the Department of Anesthesiology, Director of the Nutrition Team at Duke Hospital. Dr. Wishmeyer's clinical and research focus is in nutrition, critical care, and preoperative care to help patients prepare and recover from acute illness and surgery. His research interests include surgical and ICU nutrition and rehabilitation therapy, preoperative optimization, post-illness lean body mass and functional recovery, role of probiotics, microbiome in illness, specifically COVID-19 prevention and treatment, and in cognition. Dr. Wishmeyer has received numerous awards from national and international societies, including the Jeffrey Silverstein Award and Memorial Lecture for Humanism in Medicine from the American Delirium Society, the Honorary Samuel Rowling Lecture from the Royal College of Anesthesiology, the John Kinney Award for the most significant contribution in the field of general nutrition, the Stanley Dudrick Research Scholar Award, of the American Society for Parental and Enteral Nutrition, where he's also an honorary fellow of Aspen. In 2020, he received the Aspen George Blackburn Clinical Nutrition Mentorship Award, as well as the Excellence in Nutrition Support Education Award from Aspen. He has received the Lifetime Achievement Award of the International Parental Nutrition Education Methodology Advancement for significant contributions in the field of nutrition. Dr. Wishmeyer has over 180 publications in nutrition, critical care, and preoperative care, including publications in the New England Journal of Medicine. He has been an invited speaker at numerous national and international medical meetings, delivering over 800 invited presentations over his career. He is also passionate about training and preparing new young physicians and scientists for careers in academic medicine, preoperative ICU care, and clinical nutrition. Finally, he is an advocate and lecturer for improving the patient experience and teaching providers to keep care as the focus of healthcare. So we are so thankful to have you presenting with us today, Dr. Wishmeyer, and I will turn the presentation now over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks for having me. Let me share my screen here with everyone. Absolutely. Okay, and hit play. <laughs> okay, so it's great to be with all of you here today. Um, and uh, this is truly probably the, the topic I am most passionate about. I, you heard probably a little too much about, about all the other things that I, I really am passionate about in my career. But I think, as you'll see, the fundamental reason I went into medicine um, is because of my passion to try to really 
have physicians and other caregivers understand what it's like to be a patient and, and think about some of the things that I know all of you have been through and, and that, that all of us go through when we're sick that I think medical school just doesn't teach us. And, and so I wanna talk a little bit about that and a little bit about how those of us that, that are patients more frequently than we'd like to be perhaps, um, things we can do to, to, to improve our lives when we are sick and we, we need to recover. And, and that's, that's, that's something else I'm really passionate about. So again, one of the questions I always like to ask my residents or, or other people I work with um, is, especially when they're young and they're training perhaps medical students, hold on, let me just advance the first slide, um, is why did they go into medicine or why did you go into medicine in the first place? And for all the people who are providers out there or, or physicians or caregivers out there listening, um, think about this question for a minute. What, what was that moment in your life when you decided I, I wanna go into medicine and, and, and take care of people for a living? And, and why did you do it? Well, I, I'm guessing most people, that most of you out there and, and most people that go into medicine um, like science and, and perhaps did it because they thought, oh, I'm good at science and, and, I, and I probably would be good at medicine if I'm good at science. And then that may or may not be true. Um, you know, I, I hope most people are no longer going into it because they wanna be famous or because they, the prestige of the career. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure there's a great reason to go into it, although I, I can definitely imagine classmates of mine over the years who I felt like perhaps that was why they chose it. Um, some people think perhaps there's a lot of money to be made. Uh, I think physicians nowadays will tell you that's a little more challenging than perhaps it used to be, but, but I'm, I'm hoping fewer and fewer physicians are choosing medicine for this. Um, but I think what it comes down to is what is it that motivates you to get out of bed in the morning? And, and one of the questions we used to ask at the University of Chicago where I was a medical student, when we interviewed prospective medical students, that was the, one of the first questions we asked is, what is it that motivates you to get out of bed every morning? And then that really told us a lot about people. And what we hope, of course, for our physicians and other caregivers, whether it be nurses or pharmacists or dietitians, is taking care of people, right? And, and that fundamentally, this is all about taking care of patients and their family. Again, healthcare has that word care in it for a reason. And I worry sometimes the health part gets a lot more attention, the science health part and the care part somehow gets forgotten. Because I think fundamentally, if we're gonna take care of people, patient care starts with caring and, and caring for the patient and realizing there's a patient laying there that's a person, not a job to be done. And so um, when I'm speaking to physician audiences or to medical audiences, I like to ask this question, but I, I have a hunch many more of you are gonna say yes to the next question than usual. Uh, how many of you had, have had surgery? And, and, and I bet a lot of hands, if you were able to show me your hands would go up right now for, for those of you who are um, Oli Foundation uh, members and, and advocates. Um, and, and all of you who've had surgery probably would not think of it as something that you would like to do, like going to the spa. It's not something you would enjoy. I mean, we think of surgery as a necessary misery and endured in the hope of, of health, something we have to get through, but wish we never had to do. And, and one question is, does it have to be this way? And there are, are there things we can do both as patients and as caregivers to make this experience better? And, and so, I think the, the reality of what I wish more physicians knew, and more caregivers knew, is what really happens to us when patients are sick, when we as patients are sick during surgery and illness. And I think um, that's one of the things I wanna express, and, and I hope perhaps it inspires some of you to express your experiences as well. I think um, physicians and other caregivers need to hear that more. Because uh, again, unfortunately, surgery is a misery and, and being in the hospital is a misery. And a lot of the things we go through in our, our healthcare lives, if we're on TPN or if we're Heather, home, home care, whether it's in the home or the hospital. And, and unfortunately, much of the way we care for people having surgery and the way we care for people in the hospital hasn't changed very much in the last 30 years, um, which in some ways is unfortunate. You can all see that in G-Tube. I'm betting many of you in the audience know the miseries of the NG tube and Unfortunately, the data would say actually they don't do much of anything for most patients and we probably shouldn't use them routinely after surgery, but I bet many of you can relay having them in your noses and wishing you didn't, wishing you could pull them out or maybe pulling them out yourselves as I often do. So um, to reduce this misery, if you were to be asked by your doctors, your surgeons, your nurses, um, 
what, what would you think your providers need to know? What would you want to tell them if you had a chance to, once you're well, to sit back and think about the things you went through that were really the miserable parts of your experience that could be made different? Some things we can't make different, but I think a lot of things we can. And then the question is, why do I care so much? And, and why, why did I go into medicine in the first place? And why do I hope you do both as providers and patients? Why do I hope you care as well? And this gets me back to that question, how many of you had surgery? Well, there actually is data for this. And Atul Gawande, who's a name many of you have probably heard, he's a famous author and, and, and surgeon, uh, published data recently that showed that everyone in the United States will undergo 9.2 surgeries in their lifetime. Now, admittedly, some of these are cosmetic and minor procedures, but they are surgeries nonetheless. So all of us are going to have surgery at some point, probably many multiple times. And so I think this is really important. And then let's take it a step further. Um, this is Derek Angus, who's one of the really premier ICU physicians. Not only will we all have surgery in our lifetime, but all of us will average 1.7 ICU admissions over our lifetime. So don't use them up too fast. And, and some of you I'm sure have used up more than a few. And so someday what I always like to tell physicians and for those listening and providers that are listening is someday this will be you or someone you care about, whether it be a, a grandparent, a parent, hopefully never a child, but, but, but potentially that as well. And unfortunately, as I discovered at a very young age, this was me. And, and as, as I'm gonna mention, I've used up a number of all of your ICU admissions as I'm sure some of you in the audience have as well. And, and how did this happen? And how did I end up really having my life shaped as many of you have by, by being a patient long before I ever considered being a physician? Well, the, the reality of it all is this started for me when I was pretty young, when I was 15 in high school. And up until age 15 in, in my high school years, I had a very normal childhood. I'd never seen a hospital. I'd never been sick with anything. I'd never even broken a bone. Um, I had, had never imagined um, going into medicine or doing anything related to medicine. When I look back, um, there was a while I think I wanted to study snakes and, and lizards. And there was also a while where I thought I might want to be president. And I think all of those would have been bad decisions. But, but nonetheless, you know, I, I led a pretty normal, um, happy childhood that was healthy and, and, and doing well. And in my freshman year of high school, I was playing soccer on my, my, my high school team. And then over the, the winter, I was playing basketball on my high school team. And then Christmas break came. And over Christmas break of that year, the winter break, um, I got a sore throat. And I was diagnosed with tonsillitis, uh, or really strep throat, and ultimately took some antibiotic. I took erythromycin for the strep throat. And a few days later, I started to get a stomach ache. And then I started to have blood pouring from my stool when I went to the bathroom, which I never had seen before, and it just kept coming. And so you know, my mom took me to the doctor and, and, and I discovered the reality of what it means when something's wrong in your GI tract and they start to do procedures to you to find out what that is. And I discovered quickly that there were doctors, people who put scopes where they didn't belong and put tubes where they didn't belong. Um, and tubes in lots of places, I never imagined them going. And, and I discovered, I think ultimately that doctors weren't nice people at all. Um, I always imagined them, I think, to be nice, but I realized they really weren't. And I really felt like that they just saw me as a job to be done, not even really a person lying there on the table. And of course, this is when we did colonoscopies and endoscopies and procedures without any sedation. And, and, and so I, I began to think, God, they don't even know I'm here. They just tell me to hold still and stop moving and that it's my fault it's taking so long. And and I began to think, God, these aren't nice people at all. And, and the reality is, I don't even think they know that I'm a person anymore. I just seem to be a job. And, and so I didn't have a great first experience of medicine and it didn't really improve from there. Um, the, the next day I went back to the doctor and, and he said to me, you have ulcerative colitis. You have this disease that I, of course, had never heard of and you're going to be admitted to the hospital today. And I said, the heck I am. I have a basketball game next week and I am leaving. And he said, nope, you are going into the hospital and you're not going to eat anything for a month. And I'm like, oh, that's even crazier, no way. 
And so, of course, that was what happened, unfortunately. And, and perhaps more unfortunately, one of the things we all discover the first time we're admitted to the hospital and they, it's a serious illness, um, they, they want to start IVs in you. And, and for me, it was because I needed to get blood. I had a very low hemoglobin of about five and they were going to give me blood. And then I discovered what it meant to be a hard stick. I bet there's more than a few of you listening today that are hard sticks. And from about 10 p.m. till about 2 a.m., I had five different nurses stick me nine different times trying to get an IV. It was to that point in my life, the single most miserable four hours of my life. You know, I think it's something we all take for granted. Um, I think as caregivers and providers and doctors and nurses that, you know, starting an IV is a trivial event. Um, I, I can assure you, and I bet there's a lot of you in the room or, or in the audience that would agree, this can is not always a trivial event and can be a quite miserable PTSD inducing event. And I, I still uh, quiver and, and terrified a bit whenever anyone comes at me at a, with an IV catheter that doesn't have lidocaine in their hand. I, for all of you listening, and I'm going to say this again, you should never be starting IVs, especially in routine, regular chronic patients like us without using lidocaine and in anesthesiology, we would never do that. Um, luckily, I, I went into a specialty that, that, that we take away pain pretty nicely and we always use lidocaine. Um, unfortunately for me, it wasn't just a little bit of blood that I needed. Um, I got 41 units of blood over the next few weeks because the bleeding from my GI tract continued. Um, had a hemoglobin as low as three and I began to realize quickly, even though I was 15, that I might not survive this as at one point passed off, passed out as I bled on the toilet and hit the bathroom floor, woke up a day later, not able to get out of bed because my um, blood count was so low. The thing that disappointed me most about this period was the physicians asked my parents not to tell me how sick I was and to try to keep as much health information from me as they could. They thought I wasn't old enough to know. Um, again, any of you might guess that a 15 year old who's going through all these things has a really good sense that, that this is serious. And, and the, the fact that they tell you less actually scares you more. Um, and, and I always hated that the doctors would, every time they came to my room, shut the door before they talked outside about me. I knew they were talking about me. And I make a point to never shut patients' rooms doors when we're talking outside. And in fact, I often encourage us to talk in the room so the patients can ask their questions and hear what we're saying, because otherwise, we're going to conjure in our minds all kinds of terrible things you're saying about us, like that we might die tomorrow, or, or, or you're going to do some other terrible procedure to us. And so, uh, but I think my greatest disappointment was, was the fact that they kept so much from me up to the point where they were even going to fly me to University of Chicago Hospital as a patient from a community hospital, but chose to send me an ambulance because they didn't want to scare me that I was that sick, um, which is pretty terrifying. It affected my medical care. Ultimately, they're trying to keep things from me. Um, but back to this not going to eat anything for a month problem. Again, this is part of what the Oli Foundation advocates for. And of course, everyone in the room knows what this means. If you're not going to eat for a month, you're going to get TPN. Um, and of course, TPN means a central line, um, something I also didn't know what that was all about. And, and for the providers in the room and for the patients in the room too, um, if you've ever started a central line, you know that this is what you see as the doctor. Looks pretty benign. It's something we see all the time. Um, we don't think much of it. Uh, this is what the patient sees. This is what I remember seeing and have remembered seeing many times. You see nothing. All you know is that there's a needle about this big coming at your neck or your chest and you can't see it. And oftentimes they don't even tell you that it's coming or they're about to stick you with it. And unfortunately, the first time I had a central line place, they spent about 45 minutes, a GI fellow, young person, digging around in my chest, about right here, I saw the scar, um, not finding whatever blood vessel he was looking for, the vein he was looking for. And even I, at 15, said at one point there, aren't you awfully close to my lung? And he said, yeah, maybe we should come back tomorrow and let someone else try, and, which is ultimately what they did. But I think the reality here is, is that procedures like this are terrifying for patients. Being under a blue, gap, blue drape with a big needle coming at you is terrifying for patients. And I sedate, and I think sedation is warranted for these terrifying procedures. And I use little bits of midazolam and little bits of Versed in these settings. Sometimes I even use loquetamine, as we'll talk about, um, because this is really terrifying. And I have vivid memories to this day of even that first central line attempt. And so I think we take for granted how terrifying and difficult these procedures are. So now TPN for three months is ultimately what they ended up telling me I would have. Um, this was actually me at age 15, um, getting my TPN back in the days when it looked like this. This is 1985 for those of you who have some memories of these years. 
And of course, that meant no food for three months, which is also a bit of a challenge, especially when you're 15. Um, and unfortunately, despite all of this, because of my illness and the severity of my illness, I lost 65 pounds in two months. I went in weighing about 160 pounds, and I got to about three months in and weighed 95 pounds. And so I, I was really pretty devastated by this illness as many people are, but I think actually I was more devastated by how obsessed with food I was. All of you know that in those days, IBD meant steroids and steroids make you obsessively hungry, prednisone and others, anyone who's been on it would know. And so I became not just obsessed with food, but obsessed with cookbooks. And at that point I was sure I was going to be a chef and I was obsessed with all the things that I was dying to eat someday when I got better. And so I would take my mom's cookbooks and circle and, and, and bookmark things that I dreamed of eating. Um, and, and I really think the hardest part of this period at times was although my mom came down to the University of Chicago from the suburbs every day on a train, which is an unbelievable feat. Those of you who've been in Chicago know it's in a, it's in a tough neighborhood for, for, for someone to be walking alone in the morning and at night by themselves. But she did that every day, but she went home at night and I could hear her at night as I would say goodnight to her pushing the microwave buttons and it would bring tears to my eyes because it was the simple things of being at home that I missed so much. And, you know, I, I, I almost always hated that everybody got to go home but me, the doctors, the nurses, my parents, and little subtle sounds like the microwave beeping at home would set off even panic attacks on the steroids sometimes be, just because of how sad and, and how devastated I, I was that I, I felt like I would never go home. Well, finally, after three months, they, they came with good news and they said, we're gonna let you eat. And of course, we know what eating means for those of us who've had surgery or, or had any other bowel issues. It means clear liquid, which is a nutritionally devoid, high salt, high sugar, salt, filled broth and jello. And that's all you get. Well, that seemed pretty good to me. So I consumed gallons of broth over the next few days and actually gained 28 pounds in water weight over three days. I have stretch marks on my legs and other places to this day to show for it. Um, unfortunately, after just a day or two of taking in all this wonderful clear liquid and actually eating one solid food meal, um, my abdomen started to get really firm and I started to get really hot and I realized I had a fever. And a group of new people, new doctors came in and I thought they were again doctors telling me I would not be able to eat again for weeks and weeks. They came in and they actually shook my abdomen a little bit, shook me on the bed, which hurt quite a bit and I was a little annoyed by that. Uh, and the next words out of their mouth is, you're going to have surgery tomorrow or tonight, or you won't see tomorrow. Um, and I said, huh. And I said, let's do it now. I, I think they ultimately thought I was going to say no or something. Um, I was, I'm realizing that adult doctors are terrified of teenagers. And so I think they thought I would say no, but I said, you know what, get this over with, do it now. Um, but, but they made it very clear that, that my colon had perforated and that I, I was at risk of, of dying if they didn't operate. And so they rapidly took me to the operating room um, and ultimately to remove my colon. And this is essentially what it looked like. Uh, in fact, the surgeons told me it crumbled like a dry leaf in their hand when they tried to take it out um, and, and basically just filled my abdomen um, with the crumbled colon and all the infectious stuff that went with it. Uh, unfortunately, of course, those of you who are medical folks know what that means. It means peritonitis and septic shock, uh, which then I acquired shortly after surgery and ended up in the ICU and underwent all the things that ICU patients in the early mid 1980s went through, which are things that we wouldn't do today. Um, but some of those things, of course, led to the delirium and, and other um, strange hallucinations that many ICU patients have. And, I think one of the messages I really try to communicate to my trainees and to physicians everywhere is the drugs you give to sedate and treat delirium with, um, when patients seem like they're confused or seeing spiders, um, matter a lot. And every patient is not the same. And some medicines actually make things worse. So, you know, I, I was in the ICU and I actually was seeing very pleasant things. I remember thinking that I was in the woods with deer and trees and it was a very happy uh, delusion that I was experiencing. My room was you know, suddenly not there anymore and I was out in the woods. And so I told the surgical residents and the child psychiatry folks that always came by to torment me um, how I felt and what I was seeing. And they said, oh, we can fix that. We have a great drug for that. A drug called Haldol, which is a drug that um, the, the medical folks will know is an antipsychotic that we use um, in confused we're not really confused, delirious people. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when you give it to people, uh, 
they, they do stop complaining about the things they're seeing, but you, I think we all have to ask, what are they actually experiencing while they're getting it? Well, I can tell you within minutes of getting that first dose of Haldol, I suddenly felt like I was standing on a balcony of my now multi-story hospital room. And I felt like I fell off that balcony and my body fell through all these floors and shattered on a white floor like a glass into a million pieces. And all the pieces of my body had little tags on them that directed me where to put them back together. And so all my pieces were laid out in front of me in my now multi-level hospital room. And I spent the next six hours is what they tell me, walking up and down the many stairs of my now multi-level hospital room. This is about what it looked like, putting my body back together piece by piece. It actually was quite terrifying, very hard to describe to the doctors who came to see me the next day who thought I was more crazy at that point and said, oh, we can fix that. You just need more Haldol. And so later that night, they gave me more. Um, the next reaction I had to it or experience I had with it was, was a little different. Um, within a few minutes of getting it, my hands went back, my eyes rolled back. I began to hear voices and I couldn't move. And my neck got very stiff. It was terrifying. Um, those of you in the medical profession will, will know what this is. This is called a dystonic reaction. It's a severe reaction that higher doses of this drug that's supposed to take away the view of the trees and birds and things from patients um, causes in some patients, especially younger patients, but older patients as well. Uh, unfortunately, the nurse nurse, who was a newer nurse, had never seen this before, thought I was just being a crazy teenager. Uh, the surgical intern didn't know what it was either, said, oh God, he's a teenager, stay away from him. And all night I laid like this until early the next morning when the surgeons got out of their emergency surgery and the senior resident came and said, oh, he's having a dystonic reaction. He just needs a little Benadryl, which did make this go away. But I had a tremor for a month after getting this drug. My hand shook. Um, it was a really unpleasant reaction. I actually wrote a paper about the falling down the uh, multiple flights in my room experience in college and got an A++. So it did pan out later to help me a little bit in my education. But the reality is these drugs we give to patients to try to improve their delirium and improve their experience and make things better often make things much worse. And the day Data now says many years later, they don't improve delirium. Um, you know, if a patient's going to hurt themselves or hurt someone else, they're good at calming them down from being a danger to themselves and others, but they don't do anything for delirium or these uh, sort of uh, un these, these sort of delusions and, and, and hallucinations that people have. They don't treat that at all. And so I, I think it's essential that patients get asked what they're experiencing and then you as patients really express what you're experiencing. And, when there's a medication that really is unpleasant for you, let people know. Doctors don't always know best and they don't know what we're experiencing many times. Um, the other medication that perhaps was a very different experience for me and, and unfortunately perhaps for others was um, this wonderful medicine called Demerol. Of course, with the pain of IBD and, 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 and other GI illnesses, um, pain medicine became a big part of my life in the hospital. And I remember getting the very first dose of Demerol, which was a narcotic we used um, back in the old days um, in my arm. I think it probably was in my butt, actually. Um, but I remember it vividly. The heavens opened, the birds sang, and I loved everyone in my room, in the room, including my mother and every doctor in the place. Um, it, it was one of those experiences, unfortunately or fortunately, I, I, I will never forget. And I think a lot of people who receive this drug, who are at risk from these drugs, have this memory of the first time they get opiates and drugs like this. Um, I was on this on these opiates at very high dose for about four or five months. And then after my last surgery, I actually ended up having a couple of surgeries um, over that first hospital stay over that first year. Um, the German surgeon who was caring for me, his name was Wolfgang, and, I, and that actually was his name. Um, big German gentleman with a big heavy German accent came in and said, no more drugs for you. You don't need them anymore. Well, any of you who have been on opiates for a few months at a time at high dose know that if you just stop them, bad things happen. And um, I didn't know what those bad things were, but what I did know is by the afternoon after they stopped them, I had this incredible anxiety in my mind and that anything, even being dead would feel better than how I was feeling at that moment. And I didn't know what it was. All I knew was I had this incredible craving and longing and anxiety that wouldn't go away and that was overwhelming me. And ultimately, by the time they took the doctors to the next day to realize what this was, my dad sat with me the whole night 
holding my hand at the bedside of my hospital bed, helping me get through that night when the reality, of course, was all I was doing was withdrawing from an opiate um, withdrawal that I, of course, have been getting for, for many months. Um, and so they decided, you know, we'll just wean him off over a few days and we'll just give him a few doses over the next few days and he'll be all better. Well, all of you who've been through this know that doesn't actually work that way. And then they sent me home. And of course, as soon as I went home, it all came rushing back. And the incredible anxiety and, and sort of the devastating, incredibly bad feeling that all of you who've experienced this know happens um, overwhelmed me again. And they brought me back to the hospital. Um, they brought me back to the hospital and they said, well, no one ever mentioned opiate withdrawal. They all said, he's just really anxious. And we don't know why he's so anxious and we're worried he might hurt himself. So we're going to put him in the adult liked psych ward at University of Chicago. It's an inner city psych ward. I was the youngest patient in there by a good 10 years. Um, I remember being so scared of the other adult patients in the unit that I slept under a ping pong table in the activity room for the first three nights because I felt so unsafe and so terrified. It was the most terrifying experience of, of my entire life to this day for those two weeks I was locked in that locked adult psych ward. My parents tried to get me out, they couldn't. And ultimately by the end of the stay, they said, oh, he just had some opiate withdrawal. He doesn't actually have an anxiety disorder. Um, we made a mistake. Um, hopefully we're learning not to make those mistakes any longer. So finally, after six months, I left the hospital. And remember I mentioned to you that I could was playing JV basketball in high school when I went into the hospital. By the time I got out of the hospital, I couldn't walk down the basketball court without being short of breath and I couldn't get the ball to the rim. I was too weak. And it was incredible how weak and how deconditioned I became, even as a young person, to me, seemingly so very quickly. And the physical part of it wasn't the only problem. I, I had been a straight A student all my life. And within a few months of being back in high school, um, I was failing classes. I was suspended from school for behavioral challenges. Um, I couldn't think clearly. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't control my emotions clearly. Um, I, I felt like I was a totally different person. And, and I guess I realized there were a lot of things that had gone on in the last year that the physicians didn't tell me about. And there were a lot of things I felt like that a lot of people could, could have done better. And, and, and maybe someone should do that. And that's what I decided, that's when I decided I wanted to go into medicine. I, I remember telling myself one day sitting in class struggling that I was going to go into medicine and cure this terrible disease that had affected me and teach doctors to actually care for patients that somebody needed to do this. And so I, I went off to college and, 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 and did pretty well at college and then ultimately said, I, I wanna do research and I wanna study GI diseases and try to cure this disease. And, actually wrote a letter to a, the head of gastroenterology at the Mayo Clinic about a study I wanted to do as a sophomore in high school and actually forgotten I'd written it to him over spring break of my sophomore year of college. And then in June, he said, why don't you come up and do this study with us? We have the same idea. And of course, my, my dad was very proud that I was now working at the Mayo Clinic in the summers and had to take many, many pictures. But I had a real chance to begin to study the illness that had affected me so negatively and, and actually had a chance to run my first clinical trial as a college student at the Mayo Clinic. Um, and, and my local newspaper in college uh, wrote a little story about me that, I, that my mom, of course, had to save. And I'm sure she still has somewhere tucked away in a box. But, but this helped me get into medical school. And so I ended up going back to University of Chicago where I'd been a patient. It was fascinating to suddenly now be caring for patients in the same hospital rooms I had been a patient in and in the same operating rooms and in the same hospital that I had so long spent as a patient in. But of course, all of you who had IBD or other GI illnesses, maybe GI cancers, know that just because they take your cancer or your colon out doesn't actually mean you're cured of future problems. And of course, whenever they do multiple surgeries and you have peritonitis, you're at risk for bowel obstructions and adhesions and scarring. And I had them often, about once every year or two, sometimes multiple times a year, I would have these. And I ended up having 17 more surgeries over the next few years for bowel obstructions and lost quite a bit of bowel in the process. I ended up having the surgeons I was working with at the Mayo Clinic operate on me as well. And I also, unfortunately, had the first ileal pouch um, for those of you of IBD that they did in a young male in Chicago in the 80s. 
and it didn't work very well. And so I ended up having about five years and it strictured and fistulized and it was incontinent all the time. And so finally in college, I had them reverse it, but I ended up losing my entire ilium and, and a big chunk of my bowel to that. And then of course, one day I ate an apple and ended up losing 40 centimeters of bowel to eating the apple because it obstructed me. You know, it's unfortunate we don't tell patients that there's things they shouldn't eat after they have major bowel surgery that could cause them to need more bowel surgeries. And I think we do a very poor job of educating patients. And I really try to spend a lot of time doing this with my dietitians to try to help them avoid this kind of complication, which I still see all the time, unfortunately, in my practice. Um, one of the other things uh, that happened when I had my ileal pouch removed up at the Mayo Clinic, which takes fabulous care of patients, I will say, it's to this day the very best patient care I've ever received anywhere. Um, but it wasn't always perfect. And, and you know, unfortunately, when they removed my ileal pouch, that space it was in got infected. It got filled with an infectious fluid. And so they had to, they said, you know, we, we can do this new procedure in the radiology suite where we don't have to operate on you, but we can put this drain in there. And it sounded all very simple. And so they gave me a little small dose of Demerol and, and about an hour before they took me down there and they said, oh, this will be easy. We'll just do this in a few minutes. And they laid me on this hard CT scan table and they proceeded actually for the next three hours to drive what felt like a metal railroad spike into my pelvis, repeatedly saying, oh, I think we're almost there. We're almost done. Just hold a little more still. It's, if you just hold still, we'd get this done. And, and they stabbed and poked and cut and prodded for hours. And again, I realized this isn't what medicine should be. This isn't taking care of patients. This is, this is me being sort of this inanimate object. They're just stabbing and poking on this table. And I bet a lot of you have felt this way as well. And, and, and this doesn't need to be this way. And so this is one of the things I teach anesthesiologists. We have a lot of new sedative, very safe sedative drugs, drugs like Presidex and, and midazolam and ketamine that we should use for these kinds of procedures. And, and, and I'm, I always hope that things are getting better for our patients and that we are using them more, but, but sometimes I'm not so sure. Um, and then for the physicians in the room, you know, ketamine is a great drug. It's a drug that got a bad rep for a lot of years that actually I use all the time and when done correctly can really help people. And although people used to say ketamine cause nightmares, and that's when ketamine is used incorrectly, um, for me and for the patients I care for, I, I also have worked in a burning at many years of my life, so I use it a lot there. It stops the nightmares, actually. It doesn't cause the nightmares. And this is for the physicians in the room that you can very easily give ketamine either IV, you can give it IM, you can give it by mouth. I give it to kids all the time. This is a, a kid in the ED who's getting his lips sewn and doesn't actually know it and won't ever know it. Um, in a minute, I'm going to tell you about a procedure I had done where they had to relocate my wrist and I talked the ED resident through a ketamine sedation of myself. And so I've actually experienced what it's like to be under this drug. And then the key is to give the midazolam that takes away your memory before and after you give the drug. And then patients don't have those, around, those emergence nightmares. And so these are really nice medications that even you as patients can ask for, I, I had to ask for it once as a patient and I'm in a little better position because I'm an anesthesiologist as well. And so I could kind of coerce um, the, the, the physician to do it. But there are lots of ways we can take away these terrible nightmares from our patients because although some of my nightmares were drug induced like the Haldol experience, um, most of the really unpleasant and traumatic memories I have were because someone decided they'd rather just yell at me to stop moving than actually try to treat the suffering that I was going through when they were doing procedures to me. And it was because no drugs were given at all. And I think we as physicians and nurses and others are obligated to relieve suffering and not just look at patients as drug seeking or anxious and you know they're just whining or anxious. I feel like I hear that about chronically ill patients, the kind of patients you and I that get home um, nutrition often are, are seen as these chronic patients that are so needy, but the reality is we know what we're about to experience and the anxiety we feel is a hundred times that as someone who's never been through it perhaps because we know what's coming and we know you can take it away. And so again, I had quite a, quite a few surgeries in this period and was back in the ICU quite a few more times and these bowel obstructions didn't totally go away. I continue to have them to this day and I'll talk a little more about that. And so again, my hospital ICU recovery and preparation it's something I do every day, and, and I encourage all of you to really be aware if you're also one of these multiple bowel surgery folks who are so often on TPN at home or other nutrition interventions, I encourage you to really take your everyday life very seriously because you might be in the hospital or have surgery tomorrow. And, and I think I learned a lot from my experiences, and this is what we always say about our 
um, surgical optimization processes we do at Duke and other hospitals is that surgery for many people in their lives um, creates a teachable moment, especially if it's a cancer surgery or it's a, it's a planned operation. You know, people realize they're facing perhaps the marathon of their lives and, and they want to be ready. And so I found patients will change their diet, lose weight, stop smoking um, before a big surgery where they would never do that if I told them to do that outside of that. And so I think you know, this creates a real opportunity for all of us, both as caregivers and as patients, to say, I can control sort of the complications I have and improve the outcomes I have. We know exercise and nutrition can, for instance, really change the complications and the recovery periods you have. And um, that really was eye-opening to me when the surgeon, this was the surgeon that I worked with at the Mayo Clinic, John Pemberton, he's a well-known colorectal surgeon there. He's, I hear still operates to this day. Um, uh, he, he changed my life before um, one of these surgeries when I was in college. I had been doing research with him and he had operated on me that summer twice, um, but I still had my ileal pouch in my pelvis. I had an ostomy now at this point, as, as you'll see in a bit, um, but I still had this horrible ileal pouch that kept getting infected and draining. And, and you know, he said, I'm not going to operate on it until you have kids. There's no way I'll get in there. Your abdomen's concrete. But the other thing he said to me is like, Paul, you know, I've noticed over the last year is you're starting to get a little chubby. Maybe you're getting a little fat. You should start running. I run every day. And I never had anybody tell me in my life. I'd always, you know, been pretty active. I never really tell me that I was getting fat. And I thought, oh, God, who is this guy to tell me this? God, maybe I should start doing something. And so I started to run. Um, in fact, I started to run a lot. Um, this was actually me in medical school. I ran quite a few marathons and competed as a runner in medical school. And not only did I discover that running was important for me, but um, lifting weights was important too. And having good muscle mass being prepared for surgery was important too. And one of the things um, I discovered was that people in the gym knew more about nutrition and exercise and, and getting strong and, and, and recovering from injury than any physician would ever know. And I actually worked as a personal trainer in medical school and learned an enormous amount, more than I ever learned in medical school about nutrition and exercise in that setting, mostly because I wanted to work out in a gym that had air conditioning and, and being a personal tra trainer was the way to do that. So, so at the end of college, um, I decided before I went to medical school, I had to get this little pouch taken out of my pelvis. And so I, I told Dr. Pemberton, that he needed to operate on me. And he said, well, I'm gonna make you sperm bank and I'm gonna make you sign a consent that you have a 70% chance of being impotent and sterile if I do this operation. I said, you know, I, I can't go to medical school like this. I'll sign that consent. But remember I told you I've been running every day for a year. And he had told me when he operated on me before that my abdomen was concrete and he couldn't see anything. And that's why I was at such high risk of all these complications. Well, so I had surgery and I was supposed to take 10 hours. And I woke up in the recovery room four hours later. And when I woke up and they told me it was noon, I said, did they even do the surgery? And he came in the room and I'll never forget this. He told me, Paul, I don't know what you've done for the last year, but your abdomen went from a disaster that I thought for sure I'd never get into to looking like you've never had surgery before in your life. And remember at this point, I'd had almost 17, 18 surgeries. He said, so whatever you did for the last year, don't ever stop. Well, what I'd done is, I started to run, I started to eat better, and I started to take care of myself. And thankfully, I had no complications from that surgery. The pouch was removed. I didn't um, have to ever use the sperm bank. And I was able to have kids and I have wonderful children now and, and never suffered these complications. This really saved a big part of my life and, and made it possible for, for, for me to live the life I lead now. And, and so this is um, from that day, I've never stopped exercising since. And this is what it can do for you as well. It can really be a life changer. And I, I owe Dr. Pemberton a great deal of thanks for that. So shortly after all of this, I went to medical school and um, ended up finishing residency and, and moving to Colorado. Um, I decided that was a good place to be. It was a good quality of life. And I got to ski at Vail in this beautiful picture you see here. But unfortunately the bowel obstructions, they never totally went away. Um, and I continue to have them. In 2003, I had about three or four in a row. And I've discovered I was told by a surgeon at the University of Colorado where I worked, who I worked with at this point, now I'm an anesthesiologist. Um, I was told I had an obstruction or I had a narrowing, a stricture at my stoma, my ostomy stoma. And he said, well, maybe I can dilate it. And so my chairman of my department, who was a dear friend and someone I, I owe my life to in many ways, Tom Inthorn, my, my chairman would, after I worked in the operating room for the day, taking care of surgical patients, he would take me into the pre-op area and in a room, we'd all close the door 
he would sedate me with propofol and the surgeon would dilate my stoma with a big metal dilator off the books. No records, nobody knew we were doing it. Um, it probably wasn't the safest thing, but it taught me the beginnings of a lesson that I would get taught over and over. Your friends should probably not be your doctors. Um, you know, that you make just decisions and you do things for your friends that you wouldn't do for other patients. The other piece of me getting all these dilations was I started to have a lot of pain, of course, from them. And so I started to get written for a lot of this new medicine, this new medicine called oxycodone. This was a brand new medicine. And they said, this is a wonderful drug that would help me so much with the pain. But again, the people writing for this medicine were resident physicians that I supervised. And so they wanted to please me and make me happy. So instead of writing me for 20 pills or 40 pills, they'd write me for 300 pills because they're like, oh, it's Dr. Wishmeyer, he'll be fine. We just wanna make sure we give him enough. Um, well, oxycodone was, I will show you, nothing like any other drug I'd ever taken. Uh, unfortunately, these dilations didn't work. And I had to have a surgery to remake my ostomy with this surgeon. And so now at this point, I've had 20 surgeries. Um, and I went home after the surgery and was, was feeling okay. And I'd been home about three days. And then suddenly my ostomy pouch started to fill up really quickly. And it looked like blood and it was pouring into my ostomy pouch. And, and I got really lightheaded. And luckily someone was at home with me and they were able to drive me to the hospital or I might not be here giving you this lecture um, because the blood just kept coming. And I remember us rushing to the hospital and this old time surgeon who, who again, someone else I owe my life to came in and he looked at me and he's like, Wishmeyer, I, I can't stop this bleeding you're going to die. You're going to die. I, I can't fix this. And, and that was a really traumatic moment in my life. And I remember thinking, oh my God, this disease that I'm supposed to be cured of is going to get me. It's still going to get me. And so they rushed me off to the OR, um, me thinking perhaps I'd, I'd never come back from the OR. And, and luckily they were able to find that just the very end of my ostomy was all necrotic and bleeding. And they'd actually thought I had Crohn's disease at that point, which I was devastated to hear, but it, it just turned out it was only the very end of the ostomy that had so many obstructions and strictures that was injured and they were able to remove it and finally stop the bleeding. Um, but that was a pretty traumatic experience. And, and at this point I'd been getting these drugs, these oxycodone drugs at a normal doses, you know, you know, maybe 10 or 20 milligrams once, twice, three times a day. Um, well, at this point, when I left the hospital, I was taking 400 milligrams a day. I've been taking these medicines now for about nine months. Um, but, you know, I'd been on pain medicines before, and I figured I could get off of them on my own. And so I was at home for about two weeks and trying to wean down in my chair. My boss came to me and said, you know, we, we've lost some of our liver transplant anesthesiologists to the, to the Gulf War. Could you come back and work? And I said, well, I'm taking 400 milligrams of oxycodone. I don't know. He's like, well, how do you feel? I'm like, well, I feel pretty normal. I've been taking a long time. He said, well, let's see how it goes. Um, I'll help you get off the medicines. Again, your friends shouldn't be your doctors. Your colleagues shouldn't be your doctors. Um, he meant really well, uh, but this was probably a really bad idea. And as it turned out, it probably was a bad idea. Um, although I was able to work, um, I didn't do a very good job of successfully getting off these medications and I kept trying and trying, um, it, but I prioritize working and not getting better. And I think all of us do that. I think we prioritize other things besides getting better many times in our life. Um, and I, I think physicians are, are some of the worst at this um, because we don't prioritize our health and our wellness. And I think this year of COVID has really driven that home that that's so important to do that. It's so easy to, to let that slide. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't do a good job and, and perhaps I didn't get the right help. And every time I got below 100 milligrams, all those withdrawal anxieties and, and the diarrhea and the vomiting and the shaking came rushing back just like it had been when I was a kid at 15. And, and I just felt like I, I'm never going to get through this. Uh, I don't know what to do. Um, and I have to keep working. My, my, my life is defined by taking care of patients and I can't do it while I'm shaking and vomiting. And so somehow I was able to rationalize that it all made sense and that I should keep taking these medications. And somehow if I didn't keep taking them, I wouldn't be able to do my job and, and that wasn't okay. And, and I really wanted to get better. And it was, for those of you who've experienced this, it was like being possessed by a demon. Every morning I'd wake up and say, I'm not gonna take these drugs. And every day I had to take the drugs. It was like a, a demon had control of me and I, I couldn't not do it. And I thought I would never get better. I said, I'm going to be like this for the rest of my life. I don't know what to do. Of course, I needed help. Um, 
but it wasn't so obvious, right? We're all pretty good at covering, I think, especially in the medical field, but I think all of us, you know, have been through this, have ways of covering for it and hiding it. And, you know, this actually is a picture of me during that period when I was really still quite addicted to these drugs working in the ICU. Um, and I, I was able to hide it pretty well, but I wasn't able to hide it from my good friend who was my chairman. And he finally came to me one day and he said, are you okay? And I, and I said, I, I, I'm not, and I need help. And he immediately said, well, there's people that can help you. And I was lucky. I was able to go to a physician health program who then promptly sent me off to Virginia um, for three months. They, I remember them telling me that. And I'm thinking there's just like when they admitted me to the hospital as a kid, I'm like, no way I'm getting admitted to hospital for three months. I remember saying, there's no way I'm going to rehab in Virginia for three months, um, but that's what I did. Um, and that's what it took to get better. And, and they're really good at it. And I was better for many years. And in fact, I, I had very few um, bowel obstructions um, until July of 2014. And in July of 2014, um, I probably was in the best shape in my life. This is me with one of my sons visiting my grandfather. Um, but unfortunately, a few weeks later, I ate some quinoa. And for those of you who've had bowel surgery, never ever eat quinoa. Um, in fact, this was the morning uh, after I ate it. And I already had a bowel obstruction at this point because quinoa causes bowel obstructions. It's very fibrous. Um, this is actually me obstructed on, on August 4th. Later that day, we ended up flying back to Denver. I knew I was obstructed and I was in Baltimore in that picture. But I, I thought, well, I've got to get back to Colorado because I want to be able to control my care. All of us in medicine are control freaks. And I said, I got to control my care. And so we flew all the way back through Houston to Colorado with this bowel obstruction. I ended up in the, my own emergency room at University of Colorado. This is me actually that day with an emergent small bowel obstruction significant bowel swelling and a rapidly rising lactic acidosis, I, I was dying and because I had held off getting the care I needed. And so I, I encourage you all not to do that. They took me to the operating room, rushed me to the operating room. I remember the, the surgeon that came to see me was a resident I had trained over many years and who'd been a, a surgeon out on their own for about a month. And I said, I, I, I love you to her name. It was, it was a woman who I really think a lot of, but I said, find someone older find anyone else older. Yeah, I can't, you can't be the only one taking me to the operating room. My abdomen is a nightmare. And so three surgeons took me to the operating room, thankfully. Um, and they spent eight hours, you know, loosing the adhesions and scarring from that quinoa. I ended up in my own ICU where I worked um, with an open abdomen for fear of bowel ischemia. And I was hospitalized for 23 days, vomiting for 21 of those days because I pulled my NG tube out, as I said, um, I would. And the surgeons were very annoyed with me, but I decided it was better to vomit twice a day than have that NG tube in 24 hours a day. Um, and they had to live with it and so did I, but that was still better, I thought. Um, I had multiple epidurals, um, which was a big step up from all the opiates and pain meds I had before. For all of you who have to have surgery in the future, definitely get epidurals. They're a huge help. But I also began to realize that, you know, this care challenge that we don't always see patients as people is true everywhere. And so one day um, I was in the bathroom naked um, with my stoma trying to fix my ostomy pouch. For those of you who know, you have to change them. Um, and it was bleeding and it was pooping and I'm naked and uh, you know I'm in pain and, and, and I'm in there sort of by myself trying to do this and the pain team comes. And remember, I work at this hospital, so I know all the pain team members. And so a group of nurses, a group of medical students, a group of residents, all of whom I've known for many years, come in and say, can we just check your epidural? It'll, it'll, it'll only take a minute. I said, you know what, could you please come back later? I'm naked, I'm in the bathroom, I'm going through a lot right now, please come back. And they said, you know what, this will only take five minutes. And they came in to the bathroom, all seven of them, with me naked, just to do a 30 second epidural check. Uh, tear are pouring down my face. Thankfully, my wife came in moments later and threw them all out of the room, yelling at the top of her lungs how inhumane and how terrible they were and said, never come back in our room again. And I just remember being the most dehumanizing, humiliating, depersonalizing experience of my whole life. And again, I, I said to myself, gosh, I'm a professor and a 20-year veteran of this institution and a doctor here. How do they treat the people they don't know? I mean, if, if, I, if this is how they treat the people they know well, what are they doing to the other people, the other patients? And so it was really devastating. Um, 
And the other thing is, you know, we've really swung away from using opiates um, in, in patients, but some of us need more opiates. And, and I was on a very high dose of opiates. The doctor's room will, will, will shake when they see this dose. I was on this dose on the floor because I had a very high tolerance because I'd had many surgeries. And all of us, I think, who are chronic patients have a higher tolerance. And I always fear that, that we have stopped treating pain with opiates. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So, you know, I was in the hospital these days and I went from looking like this to looking like this in just 17 days. I lost 20 kilos of weight in 17 days. And, and I was so weak, I couldn't walk down the street without being short of breath. And months later, after I left the hospital, I couldn't pick up my own child. And so this was really a, a challenge. And actually I had two more surgeries over the next three months to correct scarring and my stoma had been rotated into my skin and other things. And after all these surgeries, it was just after Christmas, my wife and I decided to go to Las Vegas to get away. Las Vegas isn't very far from Denver. And we went to see a show at the Wynn. And for those of you who don't know, when we make ostomies, normally we turn them inside out. And the blood vessels are on the outside of the ostomy. And if you turn them inside out, you protect those blood vessels. But my ostomy was so swollen, they couldn't do that. So I had a unbrooked ostomy for the doctors in the room that the vessels for the first few weeks were exposed. And I had just changed my pouch that day. And as we sat in the show at the Wynn, my, my pouch started to fill pretty rapidly. Um, and, and in fact, I was like, gosh, I think I'm bleeding. And we're sitting in this show and I'm in a fancy suit, much like I'm wearing now. And suddenly I have blood pouring down my leg and because it's blown my pouch off my side. And I'm like, oh God, we got to the hospital. And we rush out of the show, walk through the main casino floor at the wind with blood pouring down my leg. The majority of the casino, sure I've been shot and everyone's running because there's blood pouring everywhere. We get to the front, we try to call an ambulance. The 911 operator tells my wife and I that we're drunk and we must be crazy as we describe what's happening. And we assure them that we're not. And then the paramedics come and they try to tourniquet my leg. Sure, I've been shot. And I said, no, no, I have an ostomy. And I pull my pants down pull my ostomy bag all the way off and say, look, and let's let the blood go everywhere. And I'm like, ah. Oh. So we ended up spending a night in the hospital there, um, getting the bleeding to stop. And thankfully it, it did stop, but it was a really meaningful, memorable experience. Um, one that I hope some of you probably have stories like, but hopefully never you have to go through again. But during these periods, of course, I had many surgeries and many hospital admits and was on opiates again. And the demon came back and the fear of dying came back. I remember sitting in that casino telling my wife what I wanted her to say to my children, because I thought, you know, if those paramedics don't come soon, I'm going to bleed to death in this casino and I'm never going to see my kids again. And, and I remember telling her what I would say to them and that really being traumatic. And so it was very easy to want to keep taking the opiates, not, not even so much for the pain, but because I didn't want to think about the fact that this disease still could get me. And so I was on a, a large amount of not oxycodone anymore, but others. And the withdrawal was coming back, the anxiety and fear was coming back and the possession by the demon was coming back. But I had learned some things in rehab. And so we knew what to do. And there's tricks that you can do to get off these drugs that no one ever tells you. In fact, most physicians outside of rehab centers don't know. And using Ultram or Tramadol is a brilliant way to do this. And if you're a physician trying to help one of your patients get off, or if you're a patient trying to get off, Tramadol is a brilliant way. It displaces the opiate from the receptor, takes away the craving, and you can wean it down. It's really wonderful. Adding clonidine and a little phenobar can help as well. Um, Suboxone is helpful, but I think we as physicians and patients need to express when that anxiety comes on and this weaning problem is happening and this addiction that we can't avoid often is happening because there's help. And Tramadol now has been published now years later in JAMA to be just as effective as many of these other medications and it's very easy and cheap to use. And so I think, you know, as we move towards the end, what did ICU and hospital recovery look like for me? So I had lost all that weight, I told you. Well, for me to get better, it took eating four to 5,000 calories a day and two grams per kilo per day of protein. And so again, to get better when you've lost lots of weight and you've had lots of bowel surgery, it takes a lot of work. And I like to show pictures of me with my ostomy because I have many patients that get ostomies that tell me their lives are over and they're never gonna do anything again. And I say, there's nothing that you can't do with an ostomy that you could do before. So I said, I, I had been surfing actually in this picture right before this was taken in Hawaii. And so I show them, um, I, I love to make them have hope hopefully that they can get their lives back as well. But again, you need to eat a lot more calories after major illnesses. Your body remains catabolic. And that this actually was studying the original Minnesota starvation trial many years ago in Minnesota, uh, where they took soldiers who, they took actually volunteers who didn't wanna fight in the war for religious reasons, who volunteered to be starved under the football stadium in Minnesota to figure out how much food it takes to recover someone who's lost a lot of weight. And this was so that we could send enough food to Europe after World War II and to Asia to help recover populations there. No one knew how much food it took or how much nutrition it took. And what they found was it takes 
thousands of calories, not 2000 calories, but 4000 or more calories, and these people weren't even sick, um, to recover normal weight over six months to a year. And so again, it takes a lot. And then it takes more than just nutrition, it takes exercise. This picture of me on the bike actually is two days after getting out of a bowel obstruction hospitalization. So I exercise, there's nothing better for getting over bowel obstructions and exercise, especially on a bike or, or just movement like that. It could be walking even. And it doesn't, you don't have to be an elite athlete to do this. I, I love this picture. Um, I think lots of people can exercise that maybe don't believe they can exercise. Um, and, and, I, and I really would encourage all of you to do this. And in fact, the editor in chief of the big critical care journal in the US, who's a good friend and a mentor to me, he's. Uh, asked me one day when he saw me in a meeting, he's like, didn't you just have surgery a few months ago? Why is it you get better so quickly? What is it that you do? And so this is where I, I'm going to share with you guys the, all the things I take every day to get better. And these are all the supplements I take every day to get better and to improve and, and how I get better. And when I go to meetings, when I could travel back before COVID, I had to take a, I have to take a separate suitcase for all these things, but I take all these things every day, each one for different evidence-based reasons to help me prepare and recover from surgery. And so again, these are things that you can do perhaps that can help you as well. And I could be happy to email any of you that I have a big email list I send out to patients around the world to help them recover and prepare for their operations. I'm happy to share that. Um, one thing you should know, those of you who have shorter bowels though, is the nutrition exercise is not always enough for you to do better. And it wasn't always enough for me to do better. A few years ago, just a few years ago, I, I was skiing still with my kids and I was skiing down with my youngest who was nine at the time and a intoxicated young skier over spring break came flying at him. And so I skied out in front of that person to shield my son from him and he hit me and he bumped me into a snowmaking barrel. And I put my hand out like this, just gently. And I bumped out the snowmaking barrel and immediately felt my arm break. And I'm like, oh my God, my arm just completely broke. And I thought it was gonna break through the skin. That's what it looked like on the X-ray. I had actually had two other bone fractures over the last few months, just suddenly without much force. And I didn't know why. And I ended up having to get plates put in and everything. And as it turned out, I had a very low testosterone level because as it turns out, our colons and our small intestine absorb cholesterol and you need cholesterol to make testosterone. And often those of us with bowel symptoms, bowel issues have very low cholesterols and we can't necessarily make testosterone levels and testosterone levels are important for men and women to some degree to keep bones calcified, to make muscle normally, and, and to do a lot of the normal functions of our life. And so I was put on testosterone and I've never broken a bone since. Um, this was a few years ago and it really helps me. And it's not a very high dose, but it's enough to, to keep me healthy and, and, and not breaking muscle or not breaking bones. And so again, I think to get better from surgery, it takes a range of things because the, the weakness and muscle loss we all suffer from this is multifactorial. It, it relates to being in bed too long, the inflammation of our illnesses, not eating very much, malnutrition, and then also our body stops making anabolic hormones. When we're sick, we're not supposed to be anabolic and our body doesn't know when to turn that back on. So we believe it's gonna take all these things to optimally improve people. And so these are things for you to consider. So I think the real question as we close to finishing, and I may skip over a few things here at the end to get to the end, but how many of our patients are going to know what it takes to recover? Who's going to teach them or even know they need to do these things before it's too late? And, and, and so I always say to the people listening, especially the physicians listening, that you're the people that are going to do that. And then surgery recovery and illness recovery begins before the surgery, before the illness. And it continues long after the discharge. And I think we need pre-op and post-op surgery and nutrition clinics that not just address TPN and internal nutrition needs, which of course are essential, but address all these other needs that we as unique patients who need this nutrition have. And we've tried to build those at Duke. And so for me, this is something that is part of every day. And, and my hope is I dream of a day when all of our patients, when all of you out there and all of the physicians out there and all the caregivers help our patients recover and prepare this way because I think that surgery really creates this unique opportunity to help people change their lives for the better. Um, not just because the surgery will make them better, but because lots of things will make them better. And the reality is behavioral change needs to start with us. So as we finish, how would I change care? I think all IVs should be started with lidocaine and the Mayo Clinic does it the best. They have IV teams as I hope more and more hospitals have where just expert nurses who start IVs all day long go around and start them. NG tubes wouldn't be used post-op at all, except for in extreme cases of severe, severe issues that are related to the surgery, not so much to the routine use of the tube. So that, that they, they don't really help. Doctors would never shut doors outside patient's room when they round and talk about us. I think that creates terror in the patient. And please, if you do that, stop doing it and, and find ways to communicate better with your patients. 
Um, sedation would provide comfort and be evaluated every day rather than confusion and terror. Clearly there's some drugs we give that I think make people much worse. And I think our literature says that and some that I think for procedural sedation can really help. And I think that's really important that when we do central lines and feeding tubes, even for feeding tubes, I sedate with midazolam sometimes and people are really traumatized by it and drains and other insertions. I, I give real sedation and I would want that for myself. And I, so I say anything I want for myself, I wanna do for the patient. And, and the other thing is I think opiate and sedative withdrawal is real and you know it's an epidemic in this country but I, I still don't think we as physicians and even we as patients recognize it. And there's simple things we can do to make it better. And I think the other issue is this drug oxycodone and oxycontin should never be prescribed to anyone except for a chronic cancer patient or a terminal patient ever. This drug is, I can tell you from personal experience having taken them all unfortunately, is impossible to get off of compared to the others. It has a much, much worse withdrawal. And I've had in rehab, many heroin addicts tell me this is the only drug they'll crush up and shoot. All opiates are not the same. For the medical folks, you've probably not been taught that, but that is true. They are not the same the way they work on the receptor. I'm a clinical pharmacology fellow trainee, trained person. And uh, addicts themselves will tell you they're not the same. Again, opiate um, heroin users will only take this and crush it up. Um, this drug has no place in the routine care of the surgical patient, except for at the end of life. And we have better options, hydrocodone, the morphine can, preparations, all those are much easier to get off of, have much less withdrawal. Nobody shot up pharmacies in the US to get morphine or to get these other less potent opiates. But now we have an epidemic. 85% of the world's oxycodone is given in the United States. In other countries, England, Europe, Asia, Australia, they can't believe we use oxycodone for anyone but the most terminal cancer patient. They think it's unbelievably irresponsible that we'd ever give these two drugs. So if you're on them, think about finding other drugs to take. If you're prescribing them, stop unless you're a cancer doc at the end of life kind of prescription. And I think that's the only time they should be used. So a couple other things, pain needs to be very personalized. Um, all of us don't just need 0.2 milligrams of dilated Q10 minutes in our, in our, in our PCAs. Um, patients who've had lots of surgeries need more. And I'm going I'm to skip forward quickly um, because I talk about a little bit of that uh, experience of us under caring, under prescribing pain meds. But I think I want to finish because I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of time here. But, but what I want to say is we, we have to treat pain differently in each patient. And I think we have swung the pendulum to where we're not treating people's pain. And I see it in my residents and trainees all the time where they just see all the patients as drug seeking when the reality is they've just had surgery. And I always say to them, until you've laid in that bed and had surgery, don't think you know what that patient's going through. And, and I don't want to hear that you think they're drug seeking or they've had a lot of surgeries and they have IBD and those patients always are clamoring for more. They actually need more and they actually are going through something you don't understand and you need to care for them. And so why do I care so much and why do I hope you do too? And this is what I always tell my residents because I'll be in the ICU and I'll have surgery again. And I always warn them that next nightmare 2 a.m. ED call they get for the person with the difficult abdomen um, might be me or it might be you. And unfortunately for a lot of you that are listening, I bet this has been you. And so again, what I tell them how I would ultimately change care is every time a physician that I'm talking to sees a patient or did a procedure, they look and see themselves laying there or someone they love seeing that loves laying there, perhaps their mother, perhaps their child, how would they want them to be treated? How would I want to be cared for if I was laying there? And try to do the same because to me, patient care, as we said, starts with caring. And we are people laying in that bed, not to-do lists, not boxes to be checked off a to-do list. We are people with feelings and fears and anxieties. And, and we're not just the next thing you gotta get done as the physician, um, please pay attention. And I always tell the residents and, and, and for all the physicians listening, all the nurses and all the, all the caregivers listening is you can change this. And I always want you to think back to why you went into medicine in the first place. And my hope is it was to relieve and prevent suffering and wherever possible, not cause it. So to survive illness, I think patients need their providers to know they are still people. And the last thing I, I wanna tell you, because I think it says it better than, than anything I've ever seen written, is advice from a patient. And, and, I, and I found this online one day and I really think it's brilliant. Um, and I wanna read just these last things to you. And so this is advice from a patient. Um, and the first one is, this may be a normal day at work for you, but it's a big day in my life. That's the first one. The look on your face and the tone of your voice can change my entire view of the world. Next one. 
Remember, I'm not usually this needy or scared. Next one. I'm here because I trust you. Help me stay confident. And then he says, I may look like I'm out of it, but I can hear your conversations. And then the next one that is the hardest one for me is, I'm not used to being naked around strangers. Please keep that in mind. Next one, I'm impatient because I want to get the heck out of here. Nothing personal. And the next one, I don't speak your language well. You're going to do what to my what? And then I love this one. I'm, I may only be here for four days, but I'm going to remember you and your face for the rest of my life. I, I wish every physician could, could hear that one. And then the last line is your patients need your patience. And this is the list. I'm, I'm happy to share this if anyone would like it. Um, it's on my, my social media sites as well. And with that, um, thank you for, for listening and thank you for my attention. And I hope, you know, for better or for worse, this has inspired some of you to share your stories and, and to talk to your caregivers about some of these things and help them understand better what you go through. I, I try to share a lot of patient care things on my Twitter and Instagram site, as well as a lot of recovery and nutrition and exercise advice for those of us who have the surgeries and nutrition needs we have. And you can always feel free to email me at my email there with, I can send you the literature that I've talked about today. Or I'm also happy to answer any questions or hear your experience as well. So thanks everyone for listening. And, and I look forward to any questions you may have, and I'm happy to stay on a little longer here to answer them. So thanks for listening. Wow, Dr. Wishmeyer, thank you so much. That was an exceptional presentation, and I really think it resonated with everyone. Um, we have come to the uh, Q&A portion of the program. So if you haven't done so already and you have a few questions for Dr. Wishmeyer, please share them in the Q&A section right now. And I know we did run over. We'll maybe try and get a few questions answered for you. And I know uh, Dr. Wishmeyer said if there's any that don't get answered, he'd be willing to maybe um, answer them for us and I can put them your answers on the web so people can check that later. Um, we do have a few coming in right now. Um, one question is, did the high protein have any impact on your kidneys? And so that's a great question. I, I get that question a lot from physicians and patients. Um, the reality is, um, if, if you have relatively normal kidney function, and, and, and I'm lucky that I do have normal kidney function, um, it doesn't. Um, it, it's quite safe. You know, if, if protein had an adverse effect on, on healthy people's kidneys, you know, all our bodybuilders and all our professional athletes would all be in kidney failure because they take in about the same amount of protein that uh, I, I, you know, that I'm encouraging um, my patients to take in, and, and I suggested that I take in myself every day. And so again, um, short of you being in, in, in renal failure, not on dialysis or renal dysfunction, not on dialysis, um, it can be done quite safely. We, we make adjustments for patients who have renal dysfunction or renal, um, partial renal failure, not on dialysis. Um, and there's ways to adjust for that. Um, if you're on dialysis or if, you're, or if you have renal failure that requires dialysis, um, you actually need more protein because the dialysis machine takes it away. And so the, the dialysis machine um, at that point is, is actually something that leads to you needing more protein. So, uh, so that's a great question. But no, again, if your kidneys are normal, people all over the world, professional athletes and, and bodybuilders and all the like, take this much protein routinely. Great. Uh, another question we have is, what advice can you give about implementing preoperative nutrition clinics, especially in a hospital environment with no established protocols? It's a great question. I actually was on the call with, with one of the Harvard hospitals, chairman of anesthesia and some of their surgeons today. And this is a question that all of us in the, in the surgical and anesthesia world are, are trying to address. We, we actually have a preoperative nutrition clinic here at Duke that we established about two years ago. Um, and we've written guidelines, we've written a tutorial paper. So if, if you want to learn more about that, we actually have a great published tutorial paper and structured pathways that are very simple um, that you can use, even if you don't have established protocols, I can share those with you. Feel free to email me and I'll share those papers and I'll show you the slides from that lecture that has a lot of the protocols. There's nice slide um, posters in them. Um, and I can share those with you, but it's definitely something you could do. We have a dietitian in ours, but you don't, I, I would love for there to be a dietitian in every one of them, but you don't necessarily need that. So. Another one we have is, how can you get doctors to refer you to patient man pain management when they are just telling you to use over-the-counter pain meds? And what pain meds don't slow down motility? It's tough. I mean, I think, you know, 
one of the positive things I suppose that has come out of the opiate epidemic is there are more pain management clinics. We have a very active one here at Duke and I think all over the country, there are more active pain management clinics because the average physician, even the surgeons and, and others are not really trained to deal with the complexities of all the different pain medications, some that work, some which actually don't work very well, what we prescribe all the time, unfortunately, um, uh, off-label and things. And so it's a really complex world. And so there are much better pain specialists and much more available pain specialists now. And I think if you go to your, your physicians and say, look, I, I really think I need someone who can understand all these medications and I'm worried about the risks they bring, um, most people, I, I think most physicians who aren't pain specialists are more than happy to refer folks like that, uh, and patients like that, because they know that, that the pain management world has become much more complex and there's many more opportunities you know, we do blocks that people go home with after surgery. Like when I, I broke my wrist, um, uh, I went home with a catheter on my arm and a block, um, you know, it was, it was amazing. And, and, and so there's things we can do now that we could never do before. Um, and so in terms of pain meds that don't slow down motility, you know, clearly the, the Tylenols and, and the NSAIDs don't, don't have much effect on motility. Virtually, of course, all the opiates do. There are um, opiate antagonists that affect the gut only that don't slow down the gut as much, but um, all the opiates are gonna have a, a slowing effect on, on the gut. Um, those of us who don't have colons, that's less of an issue, issue for, but, but again, that's hard to avoid, although there are now new medicines that are, are blockers of the opiate effect on the colon that can help, and there's some new medicines in the pipeline that would hopefully will help as well. Great. And at what age would you encourage parents to talk to their children about advocating for themselves so that they learn to have an open dialogue with their own doctors? You know, and this is now, I did work as a pediatric burn and intensive care physician for a number of years, um, but, but I, I'm gonna talk a little bit more from experience probably now, cause I don't do pediatrics anymore. Uh, I mean, I, I think really at any age, uh, it is essential in the, in, in the language that the, child can understand that you try to share as much as you can with them as clearly as you can, because I think, you know, and, and my parents were told not to share this with me by the child psychiatrist and the other physicians they saw, which, you know, my parents and I regret to this day. Um, I have to tell you, my mom was never the same after I was sick because the child psychiatrist convinced her that IBD was a stress-related disease and that she must have spanked me too much or raised me wrong or done something wrong. And, and that was something I didn't mention. Another big reason I wanted the medicine is I wanted to prove to my mom that she isn't the one who made me sick and that IBD has nothing to do with how you raise your children. And there was nothing she could have done differently. Um, but my mom has never been the same since, the, the, since those kinds of discussions were had with her by you know, physicians who, who really had no business making those, those kinds of discussions prominent with her. Um, you know, the scars that we as caregivers leave on people aren't just physical scars. Um, the emotional scars sometimes are, are much more devastating and much more permanent when someone in a position of trust says something like, you know, you must have done something wrong raising your child and that's why they have this life-threatening terrible disease when of course now we know it has nothing to do with that. It's an autoimmune disease and all the other things we know about it, but even then they, they, they knew it wasn't that. And, and so it's, it's pretty devastating. And I, so I think it's really important that you share as much as you can, as soon as you can with, with the child. It's a little bit like adoption, right? So I'm adopted, it's, it's, it's another part of my life. And my parents told me I was adopted from the moment that I have memory. They told me before I could even talk, I bet. I've always known I was adopted. It's like, you know, I think it's essential if your child has, has a serious disease that you're talking about with the, you're talking about that with them in language they can understand as soon as possible. Um, you know, again, as I said, some of my biggest regrets were, you know, knowing something was really wrong and then making up in my mind what it might be because no one was telling me what was really happening. And my imagination was 10 times worse than anything they could have told me. And it was only when they came clean with me when I needed my first operation that I, for the first time, felt in control of my illness and my life, because at least then I knew there was a decision I could make to change things. And so I think including kids in the decision making process, as much as the, their language will allow and, and, and explaining things to them is essential. I think it feels gives them a greater sense of control when their lives are completely out of control, um, which I think all of us can identify with who have been patients.
That's great advice. We have another one. Sharing your experiences is so important. As patients, we can relate so much. How has other medical professionals been with hearing your story? Have you seen changes in the way they eventually care for their patients? I have actually. Um, I've given this lecture a few times. Um, uh, you know, it's it's one of the most challenging lectures for me to give, but I think one of the, maybe the most important one I give, much more so than any of the nutrition lectures I, I would I would actually say that I give. Um, I've had a lot of people say that they will never treat pain the same way. Um, they will never do procedures the same way. Um, that they've changed the way they they even you know, do simple things like put feeding tubes in, um, that they're much more attuned to the, the, the suffering that can cause, that they use in G tubes less, that they, that they use lidocaine when they start IVs. Uh, you know, a lot of these things that, that all of us as patients know make a huge difference are things that many physicians have never heard anyone say to them. They've never been told this by anyone. They've never been taught this by the people that train them. Um, you know, most people say that you don't really learn very much after you finish medical school and residency, unless you're sort of an academic sort who is actually willing to continue reading and doing other things and, and training further. And so it's so essential when, when physicians are young to educate them on these things. And if they didn't learn it, then they might never learn it. Um, and so um, I have had some, at times a quite a remarkable response from some of the folks that I've talked to who come back months and even a year later and said, you know what, I, I always use lidocaine now or, or I, I, I sedate when I put my central lines in. I didn't realize how terrifying it was to lie under that drape. Um, but, but again, I think how we treat pain is, is one of the biggest messages because now I feel like we've moved to where we're not treating it and we're just sort of demonizing patients who say they need more pain medicine when it's not working. And, and so many of us have had lots of surgeries. That's just part of our life. We have a tolerance that, and it never goes away, by the way, just because you haven't had surgery in, in a year or two or five or 10, um, you know, the nerve fibers in our brains change. There's great data and pathology and pictures even you can see. Um, and, and your tolerance increases for your life um, in, in many ways, not permanently um, in terms of how much, but it, you always need more than someone who's never had it um, is, is what people have found in many cases. So. I think that's some of the changes I've seen, but I think all of us as patients have an opportunity to reach our providers in whatever way we can and express these things to them. And the more they hear it, and I hope, I always feel like I would like to give this lecture more because I feel like there's so many providers that have never heard any of this and, and they really need to. These are all wonderful questions coming in. Another one is, I love my doctor, but his agenda for me and my reality are completely different. On TPN, I am thriving after 30 years of fighting Crohn's. I want to stay on TPN and he wants to do more surgery, in parentheses, already missing five feet. How do I help him hear me? Ooh, that's, a, that's a tough one. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Um, Boy, that's a hard question. I, it's funny. Uh, it, it seems simple, but it's really not. Um, yeah, you know, I, it was funny. I, I don't know that I know how to answer the question, but I, I can think of other times in my life when I've been posed by the same thing. I think physicians inherently, especially surgeons, and I think it's a good thing they're probably like this, but have an inherent need to fix things a little bit like, you know, you know we as men sometimes have that inherent need. Um, and, and any chance we see to fix something must be better than if we didn't fix it. Uh, but of course, that isn't always true. Any of us know that anytime you have surgery, the, the complications, those of us with IBD and other multiple surgery patients have, the complications are often worse than what was going on before the surgery, and some of them never go away. And so it's very traumatic and potentially life-changing and life-threatening anytime we have operations. And, and I think that's one of the things I expressed. You know, one of the opportunities that they came to me with initially was we could rebuild your ileal pouch. You know, the little pouch you had was a stapled pouch and now we hand, or was a hand sewn pouch and now we staple them. They're so much better. Why don't we go back in there and try to fix it? And I, I know people have had those and some of you listening may have had those and they can turn out great. But I have to say that after going through the five years of misery I had with my original little pouch and all the risks I was told I was undertaking having it removed, once I had the ostomy, my life was a hundred thousand times better. I mean, it was so much better for me. And that's not true in all the cases. I think the yellow pouches now are much, much better. So if you're considering when I would do it, but they said, well, why don't you want to get it rebuilt? Aren't you going to be so unhappy having this ostomy on your side? And I said, no, are you crazy? I would never want to have surgery voluntarily again like that. And I would never want to go back to a pouch because people with IBD still get pouchitis. I mean, that's, that's still hard to complete from happening. And I had it all the time. And 
my life is wonderful with this ostomy. Why would I want to change? And it sounds a little bit like your story where you, you've learned to live a wonderful life with TPN as so many people do. Um, why would you want to risk potentially losing it all or, or having a complication or, or, or maybe having it get worse? Because the physicians only see the bright side often. And there's some that are very good at seeing both sides. And so I won't, I won't say all, but but why would you want to take a life that's already great and 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 create risk that it might not be anymore if, if something was done that led to some kind of complication? I wish I could answer that question better, but but my comment was my life is great already. I would never want to go through that. And and why would I change something that already has given me the life I want? I think talking about quality of life is really key, really key. Um, and so if you can talk about your quality of life, because I think we're trained as physicians to really hear that kind of language say how good your quality of life is already it's hard for us to argue back when you're telling us you have a great quality of life already and that might be one one potential thing you can say excellent another question we have is how do you get medical professionals to stop blaming physical illnesses on mental health i have gastroparesis <laughs> and ended up in an inpatient eating disorder unit yeah, because yeah. everyone thought i had an eating disorder Oh, I'm so sorry. It's just so devastating what happens. Um, it's hard. Um, I think when that's happening to you and you know it isn't true, you find a different doctor. You, you go to one of the big places. You, you find a way to get referred to. We, we get these patients at Duke and Mayo Clinic gets them, I know, and there's a lot of the big centers, Cleveland Clinic and other places that do really outstanding GI work and, and GI surgery work and GI care in general work. Um, where things like this get sorted out. And when you come in to see those of us in an academic center, that isn't our first thought because we have seen the rare and complicated illnesses that lead to the things like what you're experiencing where perhaps the average clinic or small hospital has not seen that and doesn't even know it's a possibility or know that it's a reality. And so, you know, I think throughout my career, having only worked in academic centers, um, you're the, exactly the kind of patient that we always wish we would have gotten to care for sooner because, you know, when you're in a center that, that, that sees these very specialized kinds of patients, um, you know, to think of those things, you know, we, we always are taught in medical school when you put your ear to the ground and you hear foot, 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 uh, hooves, it's, it's usually not zebras. It's, it's usually something much more common, but when you work in a big academic center, like, you know, clinic or Duke or, or, or Cleveland Clinic, when we put our ears to the ground, um, we're actually anticipating it's going to be a zebra or you wouldn't be in our, in our hospital in the first place. And so um, I think when you guys are up against something like that and you feel like you're not being heard and you know, they keep saying, well, you know, it just can't be this and it can't be that, that's when you, you, you try to find a way to get yourself referred to a, a major academic center where there's expertise because there's just some physicians you're never going to convince it's not some psychological or mental or something else, you know, they, nobody, none of them can believe that it's this rare thing that you perhaps have looked up online and realized it's possible you have, um, but at academic centers, we do think that. So oh, that might be the best advice. Yeah. Great, great advice. Um, we have another one here. Do you have any ideas on how to embed this type of information into medical school education curriculum? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. You know, it's funny when I was a medical student, I, I dreamed of, and I even started to do it, but I, I never got to finish it, designing a course where we made medical students patients and we had them get admitted to the ED and sit in the waiting room for two hours and then have to have their classmates take care of them. So in other words, that, you know, we, we, I, my dream was we would give the patients, the, the medical students a diagnosis and they had to learn about it and act it out, right? And they would have to go undergo through all the little things they didn't see coming that we all go through as patients, like sitting in the ED, getting wheeled to radiology and laying on a gurney for an hour because they're not ready for you, just staring at the ceiling, um, having to get your glucose checked every hour. So my, my dream would be medical students would have to place in G-tubes on their classmates, right? It's very easy, I think, as a, as a caregiver or nurse doctor or other to put an in G-tube down someone that you may never see again because you know you're torturing them, but you just think, you know what, I'll never see them again, it doesn't matter. Imagine sticking someone with an IV needle seven times because you're not very good at it and you really have no business doing it and you have to see them in class the next day. Or you stuff that in G-tube down and torture them with it and they're your friend and you have to see them again the next day 
in the next week and the next month every day. Um, it would make you rethink how you treated them, knowing that you knew them. And I think it would give a unique perspective to the medical students on this. I mean, I think clearly lectures like this and having patients come in to speak at greater length and more frankly with medical students is helpful. I, I remember we had some patients at the University of Chicago where I was a student, um, although I, I never remember when sharing some of the things that I think those of us that go through what we go through shared. Um, but I think having patients share about their experience is really important. Um, and I think we could do a better job of that with lectures like, like the one you heard today. But I think creating patient experiences where they actually have to realize how traumatic the little things they take for granted are that they do every day, perhaps by doing them on each other um, and experiencing it for themselves, how, how, how meaningful that might be to, to changing how they saw the world. Wonderful. Well, gosh, I um, we are 30 minutes over our time and we have some a few more questions and some lovely comments that I will pass on to Dr. Wishmeyer and I'm sure he'd be happy to answer those. Um, but I think we have run out of time and thank you so, so much, Dr. Wishmeyer. It was an excellent presentation and really just um, so powerful that you could share your experiences and your journey with us and your expertise today. I wanna thank everyone who participated today. Um, we will be posting a recording of this presentation on the OLI website in case you would like to view it again. I know a couple of you in the comments have reached out and said you had colleagues that wanted to watch as well. So we will get that out to you and let you know when it is up on our website. Um, we hope you join us for um, a few other webinars we had planned so to check our schedule. Uh, please visit our OLI website on our community enrichment programs page. And that is all for today. So thank you everyone. And thank you, Dr. Wishmeyer for joining us. And, and, and thanks to all of you out there who I know have, have, have gone through so much of what you heard us talk about today. And I encourage you to share your stories. I mean, I think you can really change each of you in your own way, the way your physicians and caregivers see and care for patients for all time in the future. So share, share your feelings with them. I think it's really important you do that because you guys have the, the vast experience that, that I think really can change the way we care for people. So thanks for, for being here today. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone.